Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here with us, wherever here is for you. Um, for me, here is uh, the Oregon coast on the edge of the woods, where I am working on a huge public health data project that I never expected to be on. And I'm working at home with my family, like probably many of you, um, which is why you get these rad headphones. Uh, I'm here because Sarah Drasner of Netlify asked me to come and share a little bit about what we've been up to at the COVID tracking project at the Atlantic for the last going on three months. And I'm very happy to do so. Uh, it, it turns out that to tell you what we're doing, there's really three stories I need to tell. Uh, the first one, the Jamstack story, is honestly really joyful and great. Um, the second story about this volunteer project that coalesced around a major gap in vital public health data is also really heartening, and I'm excited to share it. Uh, unfortunately, both of those stories rest on an underlying massive failure on the part of public health agencies at most levels in the United States to produce and publish this data. And that story is a huge bummer, but it's important. So I'm going to tell it anyway. So over the next 20 minutes, I'm going to talk a lot about COVID-19 data. So I want to give you just the one minute introduction to what that means and why it's so important. Uh, to fight infectious disease, you need information. At the absolute minimum, you need to know who is sick and where they are and when they got sick and how they're doing. But getting even that most basic information has been complicated in the United States by tremendously limited testing capacity from the very beginning of the outbreak, and in some cases still continuing to this day, for a variety of reasons I won't go into. We haven't had enough testing capacity to do universal testing of everyone who is symptomatic or is known to have come into contact with someone who is infected. So why is that a problem? In public health terms, you measure an outbreak of an infectious disease in case count. That's how many people have tested positive for, in this case, COVID-19. So uh, to dramatically oversimplify, let's say you have a population of 1,000 people, and you conduct some testing, and you find two people who are infected. That means you have a case count of two, which in a population of 1,000 maybe doesn't sound too bad. But if it turns out your testing capacity is so limited that you only tested 10 people, your, your case count of two becomes equivalent to a positivity rate of 20%, two out of 10. And you can therefore infer that in your population of 1,000 people, your actual case count is probably closer to 200 than to two. So when you don't have sufficient testing, you can't use a simple case count in isolation. You need to take the number of positive tests, which is equivalent to the case count, and put it over the denominator, which is the total number of tests performed. Then you can calculate a positivity rate and begin to understand what you might expect to see in the population since you can't directly measure it because you don't have enough tests. Now, the total number of tests has been what we've been missing through much of the outbreak. The CDC, that's the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the U.S. federal agency uh, in charge of fighting a virus like the coronavirus, did publish the total number of tests in the very, very early days of the outbreak. But on February 29th, they removed that information from their public website. And that meant that beyond that point, the United States' response to COVID-19 was flying blind. So as it happens, uh, right around February 29th, uh, I'd been texting a lot with a friend of mine, Robinson Meyer, who's a journalist at The Atlantic here in the U.S. And Outside of my immediate household, uh, Robinson was one of the only people I knew who was as concerned as I was about what we were seeing in the United States in terms of markers of community transmission and what we weren't seeing, which was 
testing data from the CDC or some indication of positivity rates. Um, and I went back and looked at our text chain from the last few days of February and the first few days of March. And it was on March 5th that I got a text from Rob saying that he and another journalist at The Atlantic, Alexis Madrigal, had decided to go after the data. Now, here I have to take a step sideways and explain that in the U.S., uh, because we're a federated system, laboratories don't have to report all of their infectious disease tests directly to a central authority. They report it to a state or local health department, and the local health departments roll up to the state health departments. So I assumed in early March that the CDC had information from all the states that they had collected from all of the labs, but just wasn't publishing it for some reason. Uh, what we did know is that states had the information for sure. So what Rob told me was that he and Alexis had stayed up very late one night and gone to the public websites of every public health department in the United States and looked for COVID-19 testing data. And only some of the states were at that time publishing any of that data, but they took everything there was and they put it all uh, piece by piece into a Google spreadsheet. And that turned into an Atlantic article. And after that, uh, they discovered that there was another uh, bioscience data guy that they had sort of a connection to who had independently been doing the same thing, Jeff Hammerbacher. So Rob and Alexis and Jeff decided to combine their efforts and keep doing that same kind of grueling data run of going through every public health department, collecting all the data, compiling it into a spreadsheet, and trying to understand a national picture of the outbreak. They realized they definitely needed help if they were going to continue doing this work. So the COVID tracking project was formed on March 7th with a call for volunteers. And that's where I came in. This is what the COVID tracking project looked like on March 7th. Uh, it was a spreadsheet. It actually, we still have this spreadsheet. It's still there. It's linked up from the website. All of our information is still available in exactly this form, although we have some other things going on now, which I'll tell you about. Uh, this is what the actual data looks like. This is the information that's being collected piece by piece, every single day from every single state and the District of Columbia and uh, five uh, territories in the United States. So um, I'm going to pause and mention that every time I try to describe this project to someone from the tech side, the first question is usually, why didn't you just build a scraper? And the answer is, oh, we did. We, we built a fleet of scrapers and trackers and had some donated to us as well. Uh, the problem is that this isn't one data set. This is 56 individual, extremely non-standard data sets. Uh, more importantly, though, there are things about this data that require human intelligence to interpret. When the footnotes change, when a state or territory's definition of a metric changes, which happens all the time and silently without any notification, you need a human brain to go through and interpret what they mean. So that's the complicated, gross answer to why can't you just use a scraper? And I should say, I come from the old internet. My first paying job out of college was webmaster for a big internet consulting company, which is where I learned to run servers and write ASP. Um, so even though a lot of my work has been on the editorial side of the internet over the last 20 years, I've been around for several generations of big, dynamic, heavy websites. Um, and I have some alarm bells about what happens to some of those kinds of websites when a whole lot of traffic hits them unexpectedly. And this seemed like a project that might get some traffic. So uh, I got in contact with an old friend, Ethan Marcotte, whom you may know as the person who came up with responsive web design, um, who's also just a really, really lovely human. And I said, Ethan, uh, we have we have this problem, we need a website and we need it uh, immediately and it needs to be super fast and super stable. 
uh, who, who do you think can help me? And Ethan suggested um, our mutual internet friend, uh, Matt Marquis. So I sent an email to Matt with the subject line, Hi, Matt, I have a terrible question for you. And Matt wrote back. And within a few hours of receiving this email, we had him in the Slack and he'd spun up our Netlify instance, which we are living in to this day. So uh, our first website launched about four days after Matt got involved uh, and before he handed it off to some other volunteers. And it looked like this. And this is what Alexis Madrigal, our project leader, had to say about it. Um, I think my actual quote was something like, uh, today we make it work and tomorrow we make it not ugly. But um, it was functional. It did the job. It stayed up. And while we built a design team, we had something that worked. So we had a website. We also realized that if we were going to keep doing this work for more than a few days, we needed a lot more people. So a lot of our attention went into building a sustainable organization that might be able to take this project on for at least another couple of weeks. Although every single day we woke up thinking this might be the day that the CDC starts publishing this data and we can all go back to our normal lives as much as you can have a normal life during a pandemic. But every day that kept not happening. And over the course of March, the United States went from a few cases to a hundred cases to a thousand cases. And then on March 26th, um, became the world leader in COVID-19 cases with still a very limited testing capacity that we knew was causing that test count number to be lower than the actual infection rate. So as the single source of the denominator, the total test number, we knew we had to keep doing the work. Now, around this time, uh, we began to get some serious uptake in the press. So we started to see our data being used by national press outlets. Even more meaningfully to us, we started seeing dozens of local news organizations, television stations, and newspapers using our data, which meant that these news organizations who couldn't possibly have done a giant data project like this were able to serve their communities with information they really needed about their own state and how it compared to other states. So that to us felt like a great success for an interim public data rescue project, which is what we considered ourselves to be at the time. So in the continued absence of centralized official data from the CDC, we decided we just had to keep chugging. So we focused on building out the organization's capacity and we wound up with dozens and eventually hundreds of volunteers, uh, including data scientists and public health specialists, epidemiologists, but also designers and developers and data viz experts and reporters and a lot of other people whose day jobs had nothing to do with this work but felt moved to devote hours of their days and evenings and weekends to filling this public health data gap. As we did so, uh, we realized we needed to launch perhaps a more professional version of the website. And so our design team, less than one month from the launch of that first version, uh, developed the version that essentially is what we have up now, although it's undergone an additional homepage refresh. And it's beautiful and accessible and probably doesn't look like it was made by a lot of people staying up super late at night. Um, but it's also just solid as hell. And we moved into the new stack at the same time we launched the new design. We are still hosted on Netlify as we have been from day one. And Netlify has also offered to comp, uh, even in from our very early days, all of our hosting costs. So we are extremely grateful to them and many of our other vendors who have extended us a lot of uh, gracious help. Uh, the site is built with Gatsby and all of our data comes from Google Sheets and our CMS Contentful. Uh, everything goes into the API. 
And over the course of the last three months, we've gone from nothing to about 2 million API requests per day. Uh, we're serving millions of unique users all over the world. And our API is powering not just our site, but hundreds of journalism and medical research and disease modeling projects. Our testing data through the API now powers the Johns Hopkins University Testing Insights Project. And uh, as it turns out, has gone places we never expected it to go. This is a look at what happened to our website traffic when uh, unexpectedly for us, the White House released um, on television and in a giant PDF their plan for reopening the country, citing our testing data as opposed to official testing data from the CDC, which continued not to exist. And I just want to say the extraordinary thing to me as a web person from the old days is that we didn't actually notice that traffic on the website. Uh, the website never so much as flinched. And we also, not only didn't the site crash, but we didn't get to have that extremely 1990s web experience of realizing that a traffic surge had bankrupted our organization. Even if Netlify hadn't been comping our hosting, we would have been talking about a very minimal set of costs associated with a jump like that, as opposed to the potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars this would have cost uh, in the old days. Throughout all of this, our stack has remained tremendously stable, even as our volunteer organization has been necessarily pretty chaotic. Uh, our website team lead, Kevin Miller, has done an extraordinary job keeping everything as orderly as possible. He did want to mention that uh, SAS modules have been lifesavers for keeping CSS work from crashing. But I just want to note, uh, all of this happened in the course of 81 days with a team of volunteers working at home, often with their families, in the middle of a pandemic. And having our stack be so solid, so stable, and so fast has been a saving grace in the middle of this otherwise extremely complex project. So we're still here. We have committed to being here as an organization until we no longer need to do this work. To recap, I want to say that I don't think there's any way we could have done this work on the internet without the modern stack. It has been a joy to see it in action. And I'm tremendously grateful to all of our volunteers and also the companies who have supported our work by giving us their services in this time of crisis. Uh, I wanna say our volunteers have done something extraordinary, rescuing this public data and building an archive that won't go away in the middle of a pandemic. I also have to say, this work should not have been done by volunteers. It is a failure of the government agencies responsible for doing this work, that it had to be done in this way. But I don't wanna leave you with that. What I wanna say instead is that it's very easy to feel helpless in a time like this, when it seems like the people whose job it is to keep us safe have not been keeping us safe. But what this project has showed me is that even when our systems are failing us, in truth, we are not helpless. There are unglamorous, difficult infrastructure style projects to be done. And if we choose to, we can fill these gaps and help take care of each other even when times are really dark. Thank you so much to GemStackCon for having me here to talk about our project. And thank you to all of you who came to listen. I hope you and your families stay safe and well.